Superintendent, by 6.30 p.m. on Friday evening to let us know if your children are coming along. That'll give us time to arrange the seating and all that, so we're having minimal uh, contact in the room. Now, children are not wearing masks at school, so uh, we're not going to ask them to wear masks while in Sunday school. However, if a parent would feel more comfortable if a child would uh, would feel more comfortable if a child did their wear, uh, did wear their mask, then certainly by all means, please feel free. Children will, however, be socially distanced by their bubble. Uh, during Sunday school, they'd be two metres apart. Uh, so please encourage your child to come along. We're going to make it as safe as possible. And during the service, if you want to stay for the service here, there will be worksheets provided for your children to fill in. And so uh, they will be provided. But could I ask parents to bring their own uh, uh, colouring in pencils? Again, a safety measure as well so that would be great so that's sunday school also our harvest sunday morning uh, is on the 18th of october we're just having one year or one service this year so we're looking for eight volunteers to uh, create a display for the windows of the church so three each side and two behind me um, something that they can bring in and perhaps afterwards bring home It'll be harvest light. We're not going to decorate the church this year as we would have at other years. So if you would like to do that, if you'd be willing to do that, to create your own display and set it in the window, please would you see Gillian and she will put your name down. So that would be great. Much, appreciate, much appreciation in advance of that. Let me read you a Bible verse, one I've been reflecting on uh, this week. It speaks of a hero, and that'll fit well with our theme later on. Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on the earth. In his teachings the island will put their hope. And of course, that prophecy from Isaiah some 700 years before it was fulfilled was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to worship the one we've just read about. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and we'll keep our seats for that. Oh, to it. 
Well, let's say good morning to the Lord. Let's welcome, here, welcome him here in prayer. Lord, we have 10,000 reasons and many, many more to worship you. You are so good. You are so faithful, so loving, and so kind. So gracious, so forgiving. Lord, we come to you this morning in gratitude as we're able to uh, get up and for those who are here have been able to make their way here and for those who are joining us online Lord we thank you for each person and we thank you Lord for allowing us to be able to approach you and sing and worship and honor you Lord we thank you for our health and strength we thank you for the blessing of family we thank you for the blessing of a beautiful day around us Lord, there are so many things that we could thank you for. We thank you for the hearing of your word this morning, the word of God that enlightens us and guides us and directs us and comforts us and challenges when we sin. Lord, we thank you for that invaluable guide in our lives. We thank you for the, the presence, the ongoing presence of your precious Holy Spirit, Lord, who draws near to comfort who illuminates your word. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the third person of the Trinity, the wonderful Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his love for us, how he gave up his life. He died on that cross on Calvary so that we might have eternal life. So many things we could thank you, Lord. And Lord, as we approach in appreciation, Lord, we also approach confessing. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. Forgive us for our failures. Forgive us, Lord, for where we have let you down, where we have let ourselves down, where we have let other people down during the week. Lord, perhaps it's impossible to take those things back, but we thank you, Lord, as we come to you and ask forgiveness. You will not only forgive us, but you will, uh, uh, you will fix us, Lord God, and enable us, Lord God, to walk differently this week. And so we commit ourselves into your care, praying the words your, you, uh, you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, boys and girls who are here, welcome. Good to see you. And boys and girls who are online, welcome. Good to have you joining with us. Uh, I'm going to start a, a wee mini series of Bible stories that uh, we're going to read uh, from the children's storybook Bible, and we're going to show the first of those on video. Thanks, guys. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Uh, this morning, I wanted to read us a Bible story for our children's talk. And indeed, perhaps over the next few weeks, I want to read us different stories from the Bible. I'll be using this book, the, the Jesus Storybook Bible. And if you have heard some of them before from this book, well, that's okay because it's truth from God's Word. And I trust that uh, you'll enjoy it and you'll be able to understand God's Word as it's read to you. Now, I wondered where I should start. Uh, should I go into the New Testament and talk perhaps about Jesus' life? Uh, or should I go back into the Old Testament? And if so, were there's so many stories in the Old Testament. I could talk about Daniel and the lion's den and Jonah and the big fish. And I wasn't sure where to start, but then I thought, why not start at the beginning? So that's what I'm going to do this morning. We're going to read about how it all began, how God created this wonderful world. This is God's word. The beginning, a perfect home. In the beginning, there was nothing. 
nothing to hear, nothing to feel, nothing to see. Only emptiness and darkness and, well, nothing but nothing. But God was there and God had a wonderful plan. I'll take this emptiness, God said, and I'll fill it up. Out of the darkness, I'm going to make light, and out of the nothing, I'm going to make everything. So like a mummy bird flutters her wings over her eggs to help her babies hatch, God hovered over the deep, silent darkness. He was making life happen. God spoke. That's all. That's all he did. And whatever he said, it happened. God said, Hello, light, and light shone into the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. You're good, God said, and they were. Then God said, Hello, sea, hello, sky, and a great space opened up wide and deep and high. You're good, God said, and they were. Then God said, Hello, land, and there splashing up through the oceans came cliffs, mountains, sandy beaches. You're good, he said, and of course they were. Hello, trees, God said. Hello, grass and flowers, and everything everywhere burst into life. He made buds, buds, and shoots, shoot, and flowers, flower. You're good, he said, and of course they were. Hello stars, God said. Hello sun, hello moon. Whizzing into the darkness came fiery globes spinning round and round, whirling oranges and purple and golden planets. You're good. And they were. Hello birds, God said. And with a fluttering, flapping, chirping and singing, birds filled the sky. Hello fish, God said. With a darting and dashing and wriggling and splashing, Fish filled the seas. You're good, God said, and they were. Then God said, hello, animals. Everyone, everywhere came out to play. The earth was filled with just noisy noises, growling and gobbling and snapping and snorting and happy kerfuffling. You're good, God said, and they were. God saw all that he had made, and he loved them, and they were lovely because he loved them. But God saved the best for last. From the beginning, God had a shining dream in his heart. He would make people to share his forever happiness. They would be his children, and the world around them would be their perfect home. So God breathed life into Adam and Eve. When they opened their eyes, the first thing they saw was God's face. And when God looked at them, he said, You're beautiful. You look just like me. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever made. God loved them with all of his heart, and they were lovely because he loved them. And Adam and Eve joined in the song of the stars and the stream and the, with the streams and the wind and the trees and the wonderful song of love to the one who made them. Their hearts were filled with happiness and nothing ever made them sad or lonely or sick or afraid. God looked at everything he had made. Perfect, he said, and it was. But all the stars and the mountains and the oceans, galaxies, everything were nothing compared to how much God loved his children. He would move heaven and earth to be near them, always. Whatever happened, whatever it cost them, he would always love them. And so it was that the wonderful love story began. Boys and girls, that's our, our first story, the story of creation, the account of creation. Now what I hope to do each time I read a story is to ask you three questions. And I want you to try and answer those and you can send me a message via your mum or dad's phone. You can borrow it and they'll have my number and see if you can answer the questions that I'm going to give you.
So here's the first. The first is, in the beginning, what was there? Okay, do you know the answer to that one? Second question, name some of the things that God made. See how many you can name. And the third question, perhaps a little bit more difficult, what would God do to be with his people? What would he do to always be with his people? Have a think on those three and get your mum or dad to send me a message and we'll see how many of you get it right. Perhaps I'll even read them out next week when we meet. God bless you boys and girls. Have a good week. To uh, <clears throat> be able to read out the answers, so if you can send me a message, send it in via the church WhatsApp group. That would be that would be great. Or just respond to uh, respond uh, it to me personally if you if you would like. That would be great. So uh, we're going to sing first, and then after we sing, we're going to pray. We're going to pray our prayers of intercession. So our next worship piece is "How Great Is Our God." I've already had an answer from a family who have sent in uh, the response so great. So thank you, Laffins. <laughs> uh, so that would, that's, that's great. I uh, want to pray for uh, just our church, uh, the future of our church, that God would be with us. I want to also pray for the Burns family in Kilkeel who have been bereaved. We pray for Alex Conn's mum, who's not well at the moment. There are different prayer requests. Lenny Rowan also, <clears throat> who's not well. So 
Perhaps even if I don't mention the person that you have in your mind, you mention the person that you have in your mind as you sit there uh, and just bring that person before God. <clears throat> Let's pray. How great is our God. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. We thank you, Lord, that we look to someone who fills heaven and earth, who rules and overrules all that he has made. And so we can come to you, Lord, with confidence, even as you invite us to come. You invite us to come boldly before the throne of grace so that we may find help for, uh, in, our, in our time of need. And there are families, Lord, who are in a time of need. We think of the Burns family. We pray for them. Lord, a difficult, difficult time that they're going through. And so we ask that your grace would draw near that the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit that we mentioned earlier on, that you, O oh God, would draw near to that family and just bless and help. And the extended family in Kilkeel Presbyterian too, we commit them into your care, Father. <clears throat> uh, we remember the Moorhead family just recently bereaved too and ask, Lord, for your continued help and blessing. And indeed, on all the families who've been bereaved uh, in our church, in our community, and Lord, even throughout our world, uh, as COVID continues to take its toll on our world, we pray, O oh God, that you would be the great comforter, and through your church, you would help us to be, Lord, a, a comforting voice, bringing God's word into different situations. <clears throat> We pray for the sick, Lord. Remember uh, Lenny Rowan. We pray for him at this present time. We ask your blessing, your help upon him, Lord. Uh, Lord, just uh, undertake for him. Uh, we pray for. We pray for those, Lord, who are going to and coming from hospital appointments. We think of Anne Trimble at the moment, Lord. We pray that you'd uh, help her and strengthen her. And just be with her, Father, even as she listens to this service, Lord. She's one of our number. And uh, just encourage her, Lord, and strengthen her. And for all those, Lord, who are perhaps feeling fearful, uh, those in our own church community, Lord, who are feeling fearful of coming back out to church, and their days are long, and with all the news that's circulating around, Lord, that perhaps see little hope uh, on the horizon. You are our hope, Lord. We pray that through your word, <clears throat> through your lovely presence, through the phone calls of your people, that they would be encouraged and strengthened and helped in these days. And Lord, we pray for our church as well. We pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us as a church community even as we find our way through these uh, difficult times, we pray that you'd help us to be effective, Lord, in sharing the message of the gospel, uh, whether that's as people gather for meeting or people listen online or through our personal witness out and about at school, at work, or wherever, Lord, we pray that you'd help us continue to be faithful to God through these difficult times. So we ask these things and more, I'm sure, as people raise silent prayers about their loved one, Lord, we ask them in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So today, <clears throat> starting a new teaching series that I'm calling Minor Characters and Major Lessons. It'll be a look over the next number of weeks at some of the lesser known characters in the Bible and see what lessons that we can learn from their lives. Now, some of those we'll see will be good role models and others perhaps not so good role models. So not only will there be lessons to learn, but there'll be things to avoid as well. Now, most of the people that we're going to look at will be very ordinary people, but through Scripture have an extraordinary story to tell. Now, my prayer is that for this series that it will help fuel our faith in these difficult days because 
our faith at the moment for many is being tested. That through our ordinary lives, that we will, through Christ, be enabled to tell an extraordinary story as we persevere. And as we uh, learn from them, it'll perhaps open our hearts for him to use us. So the first person we meet, actually there are two people I want to introduce you today, are women called Shipra and Pua. And I would love to know if any of you have ever heard of them. Perhaps if you've ever heard of them, you could raise your hand. Not many hands, one hand raised. Very good. So uh, their names don't come up very often in scripture, uh, or sorry, very often in sermons. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon preached on Shipra and Pua. Uh, so they are, in fact, two women from the Old Testament. They're colleagues of each other in the same profession, in the medical profession. They're midwives. They helped deliver babies while Israel was not in Israel, but were slaves in Egypt. So we're going to go back to the time before Israel went into the Promised Land, back even before Moses was born, uh, so to learn what we can learn. And to set the context, let me read the first few verses of Exodus chapter 1. Beginning at verse 6, we learn, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation in Egypt died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pathom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Not a nice place to live or time to live back then. So life for Israel, ancient Israel, in Egypt wasn't easy. They lived in a culture of fear, oppression, hardship was their lot. Their Egyptian masters were increasingly wary of their growing numbers. And so Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, seeing that hard labor wasn't slowing the birth rate, devised a plan, a really, really wicked plan to try and reduce their numbers. Let me pick up the story in verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Now, Pharaoh's wicked initiative was to cull the population to use genocide by infanticide, just to keep the numbers down kill off all the male children at birth, boys who would grow to men and potentially form an army to fight against uh, Egypt uh, in the future. That's what he was afraid of. But he didn't want to send Egyptian soldiers in to do the killing, lest there be an uprising. So either directly or indirectly, he called for the midwives to, uh, to come to and commanded them to do it for him. Shipra and Pura are most likely senior midwives and representative of the many more midwives that would have served, in Israel, served Israel's maternity needs. And so it would, be, it would be their role to not only carry out the king's orders, but to make sure that the other women followed them as well. And to get them to obey his orders, Pharaoh almost certainly would have used both carrot and stick the carrot, perhaps a financial reward, promise of an easier life, maybe even freedom from slavery in years to come if they did their job well. And the stick, well, Pharaoh was an, a very, very powerful man, 
with just a wave of his hand, he could command these women and they would be killed instantly. So can you imagine Shipra and Pua standing before the king, listening to these words in fear and trembling? Because they, they were just ordinary wee women doing their job. They weren't leaders in their community who could contend with the king. They weren't fighters who could go out and organize an army to fight against the king's army. <clears throat> Nor were they rich and important people with influence to try and change the king's mind. They were medics. Their whole life was devoted to a single task that was delivering babies. I, I still remember the midwife who delivered our grace, uh, that was over 27 years ago, uh, and I still remember her name, Hazel Meekham. Hazel, back then, she was just so, so, so lovely. She was so competent and caring. Helen was in very safe hands back then. Now, how do I remember her so long ago? Because she's from Katy. She's from God's own country. And she's a good Presbyterian as well. Uh, she recently rang me up to thank me. She'd been listening to the daily devotions of Sam. So, Hazel, if you're listening to this, can I say hello and thank you once more for delivering grace now, Hazel, like Shipra and Pure, like all midwives, their whole life is dedicated to that of saving life. So the king's orders, the command to kill babies, would just be abhorrent to them. They couldn't perhaps think of anything worse. But what could they do? I mean, standing before the most powerful man in the ancient world, being both manipulated and threatened, their own lives on the line, what could they do? Well, what did they do? Verse 17 tells us, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. What did they do? They said no to Pharaoh and yes to God. Shipra and Pua. I've read that their names have lovely meanings. Uh, Shipra means something like beautiful one and Pua means splendid one. Well, they certainly lived up to their names. So these minor characters of scripture have a major lesson for us today. Let me give you two things that I want to bring out from this passage that we could perhaps take home, think upon, and put into practice. One, it's wiser to fear God than to fear man. It's smarter to fear God than to fear man. And two, true heroism springs from faith in the ultimate hero in God. Very often heroes, you know, just keep doing what they've been always been doing through difficult times. So let me give you a thought on the first, it's wiser to fear God than to fear man before we move on to the second. We are to keep before us the fear of God in our daily dealings. What does that mean? It means we take into consideration what God thinks more than what people think about what we say, about what we do in our daily dealings. Be that at school as a young person, be that at home, be that in your work, be that in your recreational life, whatever, wherever we live out our life before society, were to fear God instead of fearing man. Now, there'll be, there'll be some times when that comes into very sharp focus. We'll be put in positions where a decision has to be taken, either to put God first or to put ourselves first or to put man first. And more often than not, the easiest thing to do in that moment is to put man before God, not to put God before man. 
easiest thing to do. I, I, remember, uh, I remember being put in a position like that. It was back in the autumn of 1994. Our family owns a small petrol station shop and tire business. And I was working there back then. My brothers worked in the tire business and I looked after the shop. And the National Lottery was being launched back then and shops all around the country were being invited to apply to install a National Lottery kiosk. And so people would come into your shop, they'd buy a lottery ticket and buy other stuff as well. And my brothers wanted the kiosk because it was a no-brainer opportunity to grow the business, but I didn't. As a Christian, I felt I just felt it was wrong to facilitate any sort of gambling. I, I, I really did not want to stand behind a counter and sell lottery tickets on a daily basis. So, so I said no. And that was really hard, not because we'd lose revenue, but because I'd lose face. I would be seen as odd or weird or just out of touch bit of a row about it back then, but I stood my ground and no lottery machine was installed. I, I guess that's a, that's a small example in my life of when I chose to honor God rather than give way to man. Now, I wish I could say that I have always done that. Sometimes I have been too weak to take my stand for what is right, but that time I did. And I'm sure you could give me an example of in a, 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 a personal example of the same. But suffice to say that God allowed that to come into my life, and he allows tight corners to come our way so that we will be forced to take a choice. Do we honor God in that situation, or do we just give in and honor man? These women as they turned on their heel from that meeting with Pharaoh or his officials, chose to fear God instead of taking the carrot their government ordered or trying to avoid the stick they wielded. John Piper says that fearing God in a life means that Seeing God as so powerful, so holy, so awesome that you would dare not run away from him, but only run to him in those situations. So let me ask us, uh, in what area of your life could you choose to fear God rather than to fear man? Let me suggest three. One, we can honor him and show him reverence. Psalm 22, verse 23 says, Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. When we honor God, when we put him first, we are showing the fear of the Lord. Not that we're coweringly afraid of him, but we are respecting him, putting him first. Here's another way we can fear God, is hate evil. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance and evil behavior and perverse speech. When we hate what the Lord hates, we display the fear of God in our lives. When it turns our stomach, when, you know, sh sh show me a person who is grieved at their own sin or just grieved at the sins of society around them, and I show you someone who fears the Lord, who has a healthy respect for God. Uh, thirdly, obey his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12, 3, 13. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the holy, whole duty of man. When we love what God loves, we display the fear of God. When we, when we obey him, we're showing that we honor him, we respect him. Folks, Shipra and Pua weren't immune to being tempted to a more comfortable way of life, and they weren't unafraid of Pharaoh's sword. But they loved and feared God more than what he could do to them or give to them. 
And in that way, they were, they were wise. They were very smart. They were clever. And we are wise if we would learn the lesson that they have to teach us. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9.10 said, is the beginning of wisdom. We're beginning to get smart when we fear the Lord. So that's, that's the first major lesson I want to give us, uh, that Shipra and Pure, I feel, have to tell us. The second one that I want us to take from these minor characters is this. These women were heroes. These women were national heroes. They actually saved their nation. And they became heroes by simply continuing to do what they'd always been doing. Now, their job got much harder, but it was, and it was no more complicated than that. They were trained to deliver babies, and they continued to deliver babies. They were heroes, and this is the sort of heroism that our God wants every Christian to rise to because it's a heroism that springs from faith. As Christians follow the Lord, they're following a hero. Noel Richards sings a song, the first verse goes like this, the world is looking for a hero, we know the greatest one of all, the mighty ruler of the nations, king of kings and lord of lords, who took the nature of a servant and gave his life to save us all. So Jesus is the pattern for the would-be Christian hero. Heroism, let me define it, is being obedient to his mission of sharing the gospel to this opposed to God world. Heroism is showing faithfulness to God wherever we're placed. That may be in the place of your work or in the place of your school or wherever that might be. And it might be hard to do. I guess the point is this, folks. These two midwives didn't have to go anywhere. And they didn't even have to do anything differently than they were already doing. They just stayed right where they were and continued to do what they'd always been doing. But they did it when it was hard. They kept going. And you know, sometimes to serve God well, you don't have to go anywhere. We simply stay where we are and shine brightly for Jesus. These are days of restrictions. And there's a lot we cannot do. But sometimes staying where we are and being faithful to what God wants us to do, that is what he wants us to do. So being a witness for Christ in front of a family, a sneering schoolyard, which is very hard, a difficult workplace, just keep doing what you're doing, but do it for Jesus' sake. And you know that is becoming increasingly difficult to do in the medical field, actually, particularly where abortion is now legalized. I read this from a guy called Dr. Peter Saunders. Dr. Peter Saunders is a former general surgeon and chief executive of the Christian Medical Fellowship. This is what he wrote. During a quiet tea break as a surgical house officer, I was summoned to the medical superintendent's office. My colleague was busy. Would I please admit some patients for elective termination of pregnancy, abortion? In accepting my appointment, I'd signed a form saying I'd be willing to take on extra duties from time to time at the medical superintendent's direction, uh, discretion. However, on this occasion, I politely refused and accepted my right to conscientious objection. He continues, throughout Europe, the opportunity for such action may soon be over. Swedish law provides no right of conscientious objection to doctors, and both doctors and other health personnel have contractual obligations to assist in the termination of pregnancy. And he goes on to say that freedoms are similarly been restricted in France, Norway, Italy, Denmark, and the Netherlands. So Shipra and Pure, like Dr. Saunders and many other medical professionals today, rightly resisted government pressure to take life instead of nurturing life, and I suspect the society moves us down an increasingly liberal line, the stakes will become higher. And we need to pray for our medics. We need to pray for those people who are forced, perhaps forced into a decision, or will be forced into a position like that, that they might have the courage and the wisdom to take their stand. 
Folks, that's the, that's the lessons from these two women. And we see towards the end of the passage that God rewarded them. He gave them families of their own. Back then, families, uh, midwives were most likely wid- uh, midwives because they didn't have families of their own. But God granted them that. And God honors those who honor him. He blesses those who put him first. Do this is just a wonderful wee story, and it blessed me as I read it. Minor characters of Scripture who have a major lesson to teach us. I guess it can be summed up in that biblical principle found in 1 Samuel 2.30. Those who honor me, I will honor them. When we say yes to God and no to man, then we always make the right choice when that choice is forced upon us, even though it may make life for a season more difficult. That's what Shipra and Pura, these two Old Testament heroes, have to teach us. And when we do make choices like that, we follow in the footsteps of the greatest hero of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray with us. Father, we thank you for the example that these two women have left us, that of saying uh, yes to you and no to man. We pray for the courage that in our everyday situations we might, we might have the courage to do the same. Lord, it might seem to be a small and insignificant choice in the eyes of many, and yet it can cost us. It can cost us the respect of others, it can, uh, uh, the fear of losing face in front of others. But Lord, help us to honor you and to put you first. We pray and ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So next week we'll have another character, another minor character in Scripture, someone that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, And so we're going to finish our service by singing, Jesus is our God. And we'll keep our seats.
So this morning we're going to let uh, this side out first and then followed by this side and then the gallery and say the benediction. We ask that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with us all evermore. Amen.